Okay. Welcome everyone and I hope you can hear me. I've been having some audio problems. Um, I'm Emily Lancer. I head up our Department of Health Services Research and Policy um, and will be the new head of our newly formed Department of Health Economics, Wellbeing and Society. And um, this is, I think it's number three in the new Department of Health Economics, Wellbeing and Society's seminar series on, on policy. Um, and who better to have come talk to us today about policy than Stephen. I was just, I don't know if folk were online when I was asking Stephen um, if he was secretary of the Department of Health that set up the Health Economics Cadet Program. And it turns out Stephen was. So I was saying uh, belated thanks because I was a cadet in the 1990s. So a couple of decades on, I got the chance to say uh, thank you to Stephen for setting up what I think was a, a great program that I certainly benefited from. Um, okay, so um, I think many of you will know Stephen, um, as I mentioned, was Secretary of the Department of Health, um, had senior roles in Canada and elsewhere, and most recently at the Grattan Institute. I'm going to pass over, oh, I'm so sorry, I should have started by um, acknowledging and celebrating the first Australians on whose land we are, are meeting, and I'm sorry that I didn't start with that, um, and to pay my respects for Elders. Um, past and present. Um, I'm on Ngunnawal and Nambri land, but I know that many of us are, are on um, different lands around Australia. Um, okay, so with that, I'm going to pass over to Stephen. Um, I think, Toby, are we aiming for 40, 45 minutes and then questions at the end, or I'll leave it to Stephen if you want to take questions as you go. But I'll, I'll pass over to Stephen and you can tell us how you'd like to steer things. So uh, thanks very much, Emily. And uh, I'm coming to you from the unceded lands of the Wurundjeri people of the Eastern Kulin Nations and to, and to pay my respects to Elders past, present and emerging. Um, so if you violently disagree with something, please interrupt. Otherwise, um, I'll talk for about half an hour. And so there'll be plenty of time for questions at the end. Um, so this is a presentation I've done before, um, and I've, a bit of it is covered in the uh, in the book chapter that's uh, cited there on the first page, um, which uh, looks at basically health policy, obviously. But um, I talk a bit about these same issues in that uh, in that book chapter. Next slide, please. I'm running off my iPad, so because I've got poor connections generally. Um, so this is a model we developed at Grattan um, to help us work out what we were trying to do and, and so on. And you might find it interesting in, in thinking about influencing uh, policy. So we start with a research agenda, which is informed by the size of the problem we're trying to deal with, trying to deal with bigger problems rather than smaller problems, whether it's tractable, that is something can be done about it, whether Grattan has a value add or not. And then we sort of do research and we have a dissemination strategy, which this model is all about. And basically, if you're trying to achieve policy change, which Grattan is, um, then there are a number of channels that you can use. And uh, Grattan uses all of these. And what I'll give you some examples of is different channels we've used at different times. But critically, whatever channel you use, one of the gatekeepers of policy change is politicians. And so you're on about trying to influence politicians in various ways. Obviously, bureaucrats themselves can uh, make policy change, but very often big policy changes require politicians to be on side. And, and we've got all of those uh, channels there. Next slide. So a particular issue is what on earth is Grat Grattan's contribution? Um, which I'll give a couple of examples in a minute. Um, obviously, our dissemination strategy is partly influenced by who we are and the, the profile of Grattan and, and the director at the time um, and a whole lot of other relationships. Next slide. Now, it is particularly important to recognise that we are in a contested terrain um, where just because Grattan has a brilliant policy idea doesn't mean that everybody will immediately fall over and support it. 
and in particular, uh, there are vested interests. So as you would appreciate, every dollar of health expenditure is a dollar of either a health worker's income or a health comp or a company that sells services to the health sector's income. And so the, the vested interest uh, is obviously dressed up in all sorts of different ways, but is critical. And so you have to work out how on earth are you going to uh, overcome vested interests and also overcome policy inertia. Uh, next slide. Um, or you, I've, I've added an extra slide, uh, an extra arrow there be, from the media to the politicians uh, because a lot of our strategy was about using the media to directly influence politicians. Next slide. Um, so just run through all of these, I think, in one go. Um, the part of the issue is designing, is thinking through what you're trying to do. And so decision makers may not know there's a problem, you know, they, they're not aware of it. And so the Grattan role is to diagnose and recommend something. The, the, the decision makers may know there's a problem, but don't know how to fix it. Again, the role is to uh, diagnose and recommend, or and sometimes it's they don't know how to fix it in a ideologically acceptable way, and I'll come to an example on that, or they don't want to fix it um, for various reasons. And the Grattan role there is a bit more assertive, namely to destabilise the inertia and the rent seekers. Next slide. Um, so here are a couple of reports we did, but this is the first one. Um, next slide. And this is a very interesting slide that, that influenced us in a number of ways. We were, we were doing a stream of work on access to care and in particular out of pockets. And so looking at that slide, we decided the first report we should work on was on dental care. And that was partly driven by the much higher proportion of people who skip care due to cost. Now, then we looked at that slide or that graph and said, there are two ways we could frame this problem. We could frame it as a problem for low income people. And it's certainly true that low income people are much more likely to skip care due to cost. Or we could frame it as a universal problem. Uh, that is, all everybody, even at quite high levels of income, 10% uh, miss out on care because of cost. Um, so this was a in a sense, a policy choice, because the way you frame the problem leads to the, the way you design the solution. Now, different people looking at that same graph would come up with different solutions. And so, for example, at the time, and I don't know what their view is now, the Australian Health and Hospital Association took the view that the the problem was one of low income people. And so you should essentially design a residual scheme to address that residual population. As I said, we took a different view that, that we needed a universal scheme uh, because the problem was, was much more, you know, you can see it going up into actually the middle quintile there that there's significant proportion of the population who, who couldn't afford to see a dentist. Next slide. So we did a so the point of this slide is to say one you know when I said we 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 next slide I think we we kept on coming back to the same issues so we we looked at access to care and we looked at that in a number of different ways and we came back to the same issue time and time and time again so one of them was on dental but we did three reports on the private sector and so we'd come back to the same issues. We wouldn't try and put all of our eggs in one big report basket, but we'd, we'd, all, we'd write reports which could be read on the plane between Canberra and Melbourne or Sydney or Adelaide, you know, short reports which you could absorb. Um, and if we had multiple issues, we'd tend to actually put them into multiple reports. There are problems with that, but 
uh, and we'd come back to the same issue again and again, partly because in our very first report we released, which I'll come to, um, I realised that the Grattan Health Team, uh, for most of my time at Grattan, was 3.4 staff. And so we had a very small um, uh, team to work on these things, whereas the Pharmacy Guild would have 30 staff engaged in lobbying. And, you know, so we had to, it was easy for us to be swamped, I'll phrase it that way. Notice that all the photos have people on them in various ways. Next slide. Um, so these, one of these is about climate change. Uh, a couple of these were about COVID. Um, and I'll give some examples of that. Next slide. So we try and write reports in an easily accessible way, but often we have to do way more than that. We have to develop our own analyses. And so this is an example of some of our stuff from the COVID time where we developed our own agent-based model of the Australian population to, to both inform my public commentary and actually to underpin some of the recommendations we were making. Because at the time, more or less every person and their dog was doing modelling, but it was often secret. And so we couldn't get access to that. And so if we wanted to make recommendations ourselves, we'd have to actually have the capacity to do these things ourselves. Next slide. Um, that's more of the, the same sort of um, underpinning modeling. Next slide. Um, so we did more of those. Uh, the, we did quite a few on, on COVID. Uh, it, it, you know, we, we pivoted the whole team to COVID and then we went back to um, aged care and a couple of other things. Next slide. Ah, sorry, go back. Um, this one here in the bottom left-hand corner is a report called Race to 80. And we were scheduled to release that, I forget on what day, but we brought forward the release um, so it would be more timely given some decisions the state government in particular was making. Uh, and so we, uh, in general, we control the timing of our reports ourselves. But in this particular case, we brought forward the, the report um, to, to, to relate to a particular influence window. Next slide. So this is the first report we did. Um, it was on pharmaceutical pricing. Um, and what we knew was um, we were paying significantly more in, in Australia than they were in overseas countries. And so this report was about sounding the alarm. And you'll see that there's a heavy arrow there between the dissemination strategy and the politicians and with the media. There was a particular person in the media who also was aware of this. And so we cultivated her. And so we had a heavy media and politician-based strategy to try and achieve change. And in fact, we did, uh, we were quite actually successful um, with the then health minister, Tanya Plibersek. Next slide. Now, the, um, the result, the response to that first report was, uh, was heavily attacked by the pharmacy industry. Um, we, the, what we did was compare the prices that were paid in Australia with the prices paid in New Zealand and I think one other country, I forget which, but anyway, New Zealand, and also with the prices paid by one of the state health purchasing authorities because the state uh, purchases drugs for public hospitals. And so we had two bases of comparison for us to say um, these these prices we're paying in Australia are too high. The response from, to some extent, the industry and to some extent the public servants was, first of all, that it's completely inappropriate to compare prices with public hospital prices because it's a different environment. And it's also completely inappropriate to compare the prices we pay in Australia with New Zealand because New Zealand's a third world country. And I, that is a direct quote from the... Um, 
pharmacy guild, I think. Anyway, so um, we then did a second report um, which looked at other third world countries such as Canada and the United Kingdom, and we found exactly the same thing. Um, they also said that price disclosure, the policy at the time was going to fix it. And we said, well, it will, but very, very slowly. I mean, you're wasting zillions in the meantime. And the government's response was to actually speed up price disclosure. So again, it was a very heavy public media strategy. Next slide. Um, this one was a very different one. Um, we were interested in getting more information into the public domain. And uh, so we, you'll see, we, I stimul I'm a fellow of the Academy of the Social Sciences, and I stimulated a, an academy discussion paper on public access to data, which was released under the Academy banner, not the uh, Grattan banner. And it was essentially very light lines, no media at all. Next slide. Now, um, the Productivity Commission were interested at the time and they were reinforced in their view that they should look at this. Next slide. And they, the government, the department released data. Unfortunately, it, proved, it turned out and a group at the University of Melbourne, um, I think, uh, anyway, I won't say, uh, re-identified some people in that data set. And so the department got into the poo about because it had released data which was re-identifiable. Next slide. So basically one of the bureaucrats in the department who we had implicitly been heavily criticizing the week before because they were in charge of pharmaceutical policy, rang me up and said, yeah, we're in the poo, will you help us? by defending what we did. And so I wrote an editorial in the Canberra Times defending what the uh, department had done, saying, look, they made a mistake, but they were, they were trying to do the right sort of thing. And so what that vignette is, is to show is that the, the close relationships we had that, and the trusted relationships that they, were, they felt they could legitimately ask me to do this sort of stuff to, to weigh into a, a very relevant medium namely the Canberra Times, to, to support them in, in what they were doing. Next slide. Um, so this one was a very different um, influence strategy. What we were interested here was um, the, the issue of um, so-called low, no or low value care. And you'll see that we don't have a line going through the media. We could have sensationalized this and had huge, you know, all this unnecessary care being done, but we essentially wanted to work through stakeholders and the bureaucracy, in a sense as a Trojan horse, um, to actually try and influence the profession itself directly. And so we held up publication of this report, next slide, until, we submitted an article um, to next slide to the MJA, um, and we held up publication of the report until the MJA article came out. And we were trying to um, influence the behaviour of private insurers and, and clinical leaders in the medical profession to take this issue of no and low value care seriously. Um, even though we did it all. Uh, relatively quietly, we did get an article in the Australian Financial Review anyway. Next slide. Um, so what we're trying to do in all of this is develop sustained campaigns, coming back to the same issue time and time again, and have a clear and distinct influence strategy for each report. Next slide. Um, we also did one on a report on a sugary drinks tax. Next slide. Um, and, you know, there's increasing obesity, next slide. Um, what we were interested in is that this is work done by, I think, PwC that basically showed that, that the cost of obesity to the Australian economy, 
in fact, to the Australian government is about 5.3 billion. About 10% of that, about 500 million, is attributable to sugary drinks. And you can see that their XX costs of pharmaceuticals, hospital care, GPs, and so on. Next slide, please. So what we are arguing is not to have a sugary drinks tax to change behavior, although it will do that, next slide, but rather the, we were, next slide, we were framing the sugary drinks tax, not as a nanny state sort of intervention, next slide, but rather as a pecuniary externality, that is my consumption of a sugary drink impacts on other people and so it was, you know, the, at the time there was a lot of criticism of nanny state and, you know, everybody should be allowed to do what they like, but we were trying to conceptualise the case for a sugary drinks tax uh, as, uh, as, a, as an externality one. Next slide. Now, um, the, so in, in writing that report, we had to think about what were the sorts of things, what are the sorts of criticisms that there've been previously? Well, one of the criticisms was sugary, was the nanny state one. But the other criticism was that it, uh, the sugary drinks tax was regressive, regressive. And that is indeed true. Um, that is um, the people in the lowest quintile of household expenditure would uh, spend a lot more proportionately of their income than people in the highest quintile, which is what the yellow diamonds show. However, you'll see that the range is from about 0.45 or so as a percent of um, household income to about 0.75. And so the, the, even though it is truly regressive, as you can see, the range is trivially small. And for that reason, ACOS, a, a group that, that advocates on behalf of lower income people uh, were supportive of our approach. And we actually look, uh, uh, met with them prior to release of the report. So we were trying to, in, in the report, we were trying to respond to known criticisms. Next, next slide. Um, another criticism was it was going to kill the sugar industry. Well, what, what this slide shows is that the proportion of sugar that would have had to be diverted from sugary drinks to export was trivially small. This didn't stop a whole lot of criticism, but we were trying to respond to the industry argument. Next slide. So um, this is the in, next slide. So what we did with this release, the, the Grattan value add was about partly the ability to attract more publicity and reframe the debate. We launched this report at Parliament House and we had one, um, Richard Di Natale, who was the Greens leader at the time, a Liberal backbencher, Russell Broadbent, and a Labor backbencher, Emma McBride, who's now the, uh, an assistant minister in the health portfolio. And those three spoke at the launch. Um, Russell Broadbent, a good retail politician saying sugar, sugar, honey, honey, as part of the launch. And I could just see him working the um, senior citizen centres around his electorate. Um, but uh, we had the Obesity Policy Co Coalition came up to Canberra and released something on the same day. They are available for media on the same day. And we were, you know, we'd worked closely with them. So it was a partnership uh, with other stakeholders. Next slide. Um, next slide. Um, it wasn't all hunky dory. Next slide. Um, oh, we got criticised by um, Barnaby Joyce and others. I now want to move on to a different thing, which is about how we do things. Uh, we put a lot of energy into visuals um, because chart design, as I'll point out, is analysis. Um, next slide. So. Here's an example. Oh, this is no, what I get. Yeah, here's so here's an example. What we were interested in was um, a huge variation in costs in individual hospitals in Australia. 
Next slide. Now, what you'll see from this is that if you see this graph, you can tell from the title what we are trying, the message we're trying to get. So there's a talking title. So all of our um, graphs have a talking title where you, you, you don't have to struggle to work out what is the message, what is the lesson we want you to learn from this particular graph. Next slide. You can see that all of the, uh, that we've based everything uh, at, at zero. And so we are focusing in this slide on within state variation. There's huge among state variation as well, but that's not what we're interested in. So you can't tell from that graph that Victoria at the time was cheaper than Western Australia, for example, because we wanted to point the finger at the state to say, I don't care that you're expensive relative to Victoria. What I'm saying is there's huge variation within Western Australia, and that's something in your control. So that's where we shape the graph to bring out that point. Next slide. And what you can see is there's no names of any of the hospitals here. Um, we, we've just, um, sorry, let's turn that off. Um, because that's not important for the argument we're, rich, we're, we're pursuing. Next slide. Um, now, behind that simple presentation is some sophisticated analysis. Next slide. Because we've got two audiences we're playing to, the general public and also the policy nerds who are interested in, that, uh, in all that Greek. Next slide. Um, and the same is true in the dental scheme stuff we did. Now, I now want to give you another example. This is a private health insurance. We want to think about the deteriorating risk pool of private health insurance, what we call the death spiral. And um, the issue was, how do we convey that? Next slide. So I have to explain things pretty quickly in the media. And this, this graph is, shows that younger people are rapidly dropping out of private health insurance. Look at the bottom two lines there. Next slide. That data can also be presented that way. So these are exactly the same data, but this presentation is much sharper. So as I said, we spent a lot of time thinking about how to present things. And we started with the previous slide and we thought, yeah, that's not clear enough. And so this is the way we presented it. So the, the, the point we're trying to make is that the insurance pool is getting older and much, much clearer in this slide than the previous one. Next slide. We also, this is another example that, um, you know, the, 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 the spending on older people is going up more rapidly than younger people. Next slide. This is exactly the same, more or less the same data, um, but it's showing the, the share of insured persons and the share of benefits. Next slide. This is exactly the same data again, but it's much clearer. So again, we spent a lot of time thinking about how to make that presentation. Next slide. So this is, next slide. Um, you'll see there I put some uh, quid pro quo. You know, I did a lot of media stuff unrelated to Grattan reports in the expectation that if I talk to them when they want me to talk to them, they'd listen to me when I wanted to talk to them. And similarly, lots of interactions with stakeholders as we went along. Next slide. Um, there, yeah, said so the media were very hungry. Next slide. Uh, this is how I was evaluated at the time at Grattan. Um, you'll see these are all of the programs on the right hand side, but these lines include how many reports did I write, how many um, op eds did I write, how many times was I cited in the media, how many presentations did I give, how many stakeholders did I meet with. Now, these metrics are very, very different from the metrics of a university. I was not evaluated on how many refereed articles or how many grants I received. I was, the purpose of Grattan is, is influence. And so I, these are intermediate measures of influence, how you actually get to influence. Next slide. And uh, so next slide. On the right hand side there, we made an assessment, a qualitative judgment assessment every year about how much influence we actually had had 
the left hand side are instrument uh, uh, intermediate measures the right hand side is you know to what extent we did we frame the debate and so on and i think that's the last slide next slide any questions there you go so if you get rid of those slides so i can see the people thank you it was half an hour Brilliant. Thank you, Stephen. We we'll open up for questions and comments. I have two, but let's let's go to everyone else first. Questions and comments. Yes. Uh, I hope I'm pronouncing this correctly. Florian. Hi. Yes, that's correct. Thanks. Um, thanks for this really interesting uh, presentation and talk. Uh, very lovely. Um, one question. Uh, regarding your very last slide, when you mentioned um, that you do qualitative evaluations to have an idea about your impact, if I understood it correctly, um, I would like to know more about this and, and whether you do this kind of structurally or, or rigorously to, to actually also over time track if this strategy works or how well it works in terms of actually having the, the impact that you think you have. So. Um, it, I would be interested to hear more about how you actually um, assess the, the, your, your, the, the success of, of this approach for yourself and your team. Thanks. So, um, giving you one to answer, it's somewhat rigorous and somewhat not. So, often it is very hard to make such a judgment because we don't know what's happening inside the department or inside the minister's office. We can only tell by what actually happens and sometimes by how we are cited. Um, so, for example, on one of our workforce reports, um, uh, I discovered that our work for, that this particular report was perfectly timed because the, a, a state minister, a state government was deciding about workforce type issues and that we were very timely and we were cited and, and it was influential inside the state. There was nothing in the media about that. And I was just told at a conference, thanked at a conference about that. So we can't always know. Uh, and so it's partly on what we see, partly gossip. Secondly, John Daly, the former CEO of Grattan, took a hundred reports that Grattan had done over the time as, as he was a CEO. And, tried to actually make another assessment of that kind and made sort of judgments about it all and, and um, deduced from that some of the factors that might influence whether we had an influence. Uh, and he wrote a report about that, which I've forgotten what it's called, but it was one of his last reports at Grattan. Um, but so it's not a perfect science, but as I said, we wanted to in our evaluation process go beyond just the uh, intermediate measures to try and look at policy outcome, policy influence as an outcome. Oh, yeah. Thanks, Stephen. Uh, Emily Thank Banks you. and then to Gabrielle. Thanks so much, Stephen. That was really fantastic. And um, I have to say that it's amazing thinking that you are 3.6 uh, people, uh, like the depth of influence you've had has been astonishing. So I think- 3.4, huge... Emily, 3.4. Oh, 3.4, sorry. Well, there you go. Anyway, it, it, it's, it's extraordinary. And I think, you know, we all know about your presence and things. And I think it says a lot about the sort of uh, strategic way that you've conducted yourself. Um, I had a question about pushback and about um, being swamped by it. I don't know, I was recently introduced to Brandolini's law. I don't know if you're familiar with Brandolini's law. It's called the bullshit asymmetry law. And it, it posits, it's an internet based thing, but it posits that the amount of energy it takes to refute bullshit is an order of magnitude greater than the amount of energy it takes to generate bullshit. Um, so if you think that somebody said, oh, well, um, I don't know, 90% of uh, GP consultations are bulk bills. Like it takes no energy at all to generate, to say that, but to, to refute it takes quite a bit of energy. And that would happen repeatedly for you. You'd have the pharmaceutical guild saying, oh, actually you shouldn't compare it with New Zealand or in the state. And then you have to then do a huge amount of work to refute it. Um, so 
and it's very easy, I think, to be swamped by it, particularly when you're being effective. I know in tobacco control, we have a thing called the screen test, which is if you are effective, industry will screen and you then have to refute it. So I wondered, how do you, first of all, how much influence do you think the pushback has? Like, is it really necessary to respond to all misinformation? And how do you prioritise what you do and don't respond to, given Brandolini's law? Yeah, it, you can't possibly respond to everything. Um, but we, we, there's a, we have to set priorities about what areas we'd work in and what areas we wouldn't. But I was at Grattan for 10 years, and so we slowly developed a back book. And we, so responding in the media became easier because we could cite some of the stuff from previous. However, that has strengths and weaknesses. So we did a couple of reports right early on pharmaceutical benefits pricing. We did three early, so we come, keep on coming back to it. And then the media were kept on quoting one of the savings estimates from our early reports, and we knew that they were no longer those savings. So we did another report um, to say, savings aren't as big now, um, so that hopefully they'd, they'd quote the contemporary numbers, not the previous numbers. And some, sometimes coming back to the report was easy. So that, that, that report we did updating our numbers was actually quite quick and we had an intern do it um, over, over summer because we had all the, met, we'd worked out the method, we had all the spreadsheets, we knew where to go. And so it was actually quite a quick one to work on, but it still took someone some time. Um, yeah, so I suppose, Emily, it, 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 you've got to make a call on which ones are important and which ones aren't. Um, uh, the bulk billing one is an interesting one. There was a huge amount of publicity about the decline in bulk billing um, based on anecdote rather than anything else. And so, you know, I, I was very careful in the media um, to be saying, yeah, it may be true, it may not be true. I mean, um, uh, and so to express uncertainty when I wasn't confident of the numbers, but that I said, yeah, there's, there, you're quite right. There's, it's easy for a industry group, especially, to invent a new statistic and say, "Well, look at this. This, you know, this shows X." And you think, "Yeah." Luckily, um, as I said in the thing about the quid pro quo of the media, they would often ring me up and say, "Well, what do you think?" And you know, I'd say, "Well, of course they say that you know, sort of thing." So. It, 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 it helps if you've got a good relationship with the journalists. Um, in the good old days, journalists had time to think before they wrote. Um, unfortunately, it's not quite the same now because you don't necessarily have that journalist with that much expertise. Not a good answer, but um, that's all I can give you, Emily. <laughs> Thanks, Stephen. Over to Gabrielle and then to Mark. Uh, thanks from me too. That was fascinating. Um, I wonder if you could elaborate a bit more on context, uh, the context of Grattan, and particularly what it means, what the lessons that you've drawn are for us as a university-based uh, school and department within that school. So what can we learn from what you've done? And um, what, are, what do you think the major differences are between what you were able to do and what we might be able to do? Thanks. So good question, Gabrielle. It's, I've often thought about this because I've got a friend who's a professor in government at the University of Melbourne and, and they're in a totally different world from our world, even though we obviously overlap. Um, so Grattan was set up with an endowment. It's not, the endowment's not quite enough to keep us alive infinitely, but the policy was we don't chase money. So we don't chase consultancies, we don't chase grants. And so that immediately gives us a 50% productivity improvement over you, for example. Um, we don't, our output is not measured in terms of published articles, which also gives us a productivity improvement over you. I don't know what that would be. Um, we have, so there's altogether about 30 staff at Grattan, um, including a four day a week journalist. So more or less everything, well, everything we put out went through that journalist, partly to help us get the narrative right, 
what's the structure of the report? You know, have you got the logic right? Um, what's your key message? Those sorts of things. But partly to make sure we wrote in English, not in academies or some other language, so that our aim was public reports that were were written at uh, written with good media grants like Death Spiral and things like that. We didn't write Death Spiral, that came from a journalist. And if you look at that particular report, you'll find it was only mentioned in the overview. Um, but anyway, um, so uh, it's a very, we're trying to do very different things. Um, all of our, we do very, while I was at Grattan in the health team, we did no data, new data collection data generation. Everything was secondary analysis of existing data. Yeah, everything. Sometimes it was secondary analysis of the raw data. We had access to the hospital unit record data, for example. Sometimes it was um, an, an analyst, the repackaging of what other people <clears throat> had done. But it was, we didn't go out and collect data. Some of the other teams have done that, but we didn't. Um, admittedly, getting access to the data often takes months and months and months, as you're well aware. Um, so it, it was a different knowledge generation process, and we were interested in, if you call it this, the scholarship of application. Uh, that is, how do you change policy, a very applied scholarship, um rather than the theoretical scholarship but as i showed you we did need to know something about um econometrics or or whatever um so it is i think one of the problems for academic life that now the metrics include impact when um you're often not set up to do that and so you're in a very complex situation. I don't think, I don't know again whether that worked very well, but yeah, it, it, it is a different way of working. Uh, in, incidentally, Grattan was one of the most collegial organisations I ever worked in. So it was very, very collegial, which, which actually helped with the productivity as well, because, you know, when all of our reports were independently QC within Grattan as well as outside of Grattan. Um, and, you know, that was all done collegially and so on. Excellent. What a great question and excellent answer for, for what we're hoping to do in terms. Over to Mark. Thanks. Thanks. Thanks for a great presentation, Stephen. That's um, um, having been sort of a, a recipient of some of your channels over the years. It's, um, uh, it's good to see that there's a, a a good scientific model behind it. I'm just interested in your, um, uh, I was really taken by the different channels that you use and how you adapt those channels according to the, the outcome, the target or the issue. Um, and I, I recall one very, very successful lobbyist um, who, uh, who said that those that seek to prosecute their argument in the media do so because they fail to prosecute it in the forums that really matter. Um, and Russell Schneider, if I recall. That's, that's the one. <laughs> that's exactly right. It was Russell Schneider, who was the, the private health insurance lobbyist and a very, very successful lobbyist for his members, I have to say. Not so much for the industry, but anyway. Um, but I'm just interested in, um, in that, Stephen, because my own observations of the work that Grattan has done and I've observed you doing the field work is you seem to spend far more time outside of the media uh, when you're doing your kind of um, influencing work. You seem to spend a lot, or well, I observed, uh, you seem to be spending a lot more time using those other channels, you know, the bureaucratic channel, the ministerial staffer channel, um, other kind of, you know, coalitions of, of interest. Um, and the media was in some ways, more or less the icing on the cake. Um, I'd just be interested in you to comment on the balance yeah, of the channels. It, it, it's, it, thanks, thanks, Mark. The, the media, you want to get voters, to, you, you, part of your job 
is to make it easier for the government to make a decision. Yeah. And part of that is calling out the rent seekers, the Russell Snyders of the world. Part of it is that the public gestalt, in a sense, that the, the public would feel this is a sensible thing to do. And so you, 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 you've sort of a pincer movement. Um, and, you know, one of the, the recent ones we did was about out-of-pocket costs. And we were presenting that to the department. This was under the previous government. And they said, well, why haven't you talked about this? And then they came out with their wheelbarrow of ideas that they've obviously been pursuing for years internally with no effect. And so we said, mm, thanks very much. And we added an extra page into the report, which was their ideas that they wanted, and we were their mouthpiece in a sense. So it was this quid pro quo that, you know, we, we said, this is a great idea. You know, we'll put this in our report in the hope that someone will pick it up. And, and, and this external thing in a Grattan report is an external thing that makes it easier for them to pursue it internally. So we were, and, and that didn't get picked up in the media whatsoever because it was such a nerdy issue. But it was an important one for them and I think, it's a good, it was a good idea. So it really, you saw a lot of me in the media, but it was also, we were doing lots of other things at the same time, as you point out. My, I had a wonderful job at Grant and I didn't have to do any work at all. Um, so we had 3.4 staff, of which one was me. And basically the two, the two full-timers, did all the work and they were young and very very bright and um so they fashioned the bullets and i fired them that's not quite true but um it it was um it made things easier when we had a we had a an engine to do these things and my job was the external facing one um and Obviously, they came along to some briefings with me, um, depending on what sort of, the more political the briefing, the less they were present, so I suppose is a way of phrasing that. The more bureaucratic the briefing, the more they were present. Thanks, Stephen. I don't see any other hands up, so I'll ask a question um, while others are thinking of comments and questions. But Stephen, I think you're, what I found fascinating about your presentation was the very nuanced way you chose Grattan chose to have influence and the different routes you did to that. It wasn't a one size fits all. I wondered if you could speak to how you chose. Sometimes you used the media, sometimes you didn't, and the different avenues. How a priori would you make that decision about which route you would take to influence? Because all of them did seem influential, um, yeah. but also very nuanced. So I wondered if you could speak yeah, to that. Yeah, thanks, Emily. Um, I think partly it was about risks. And if I use the no and low value care one, we were one of the first to be, to be talking about that issue in the public domain. And I was fearful that if we got off on the wrong foot, the medical profession especially would pull up the drawbridge and say, this is all rubbish, you're not allowed to do this, you know, go away and so on. So, and I could easily have used a very high profile media strategy on that one, you know, zillions of dollars and thousands of lives and X thousand un unnecessary operations, that sort of thing. But I, my, my gut feeling, and a lot of these things are gut feelings, Emily, um, was that there was a high risk of doing that, that in doing so, you'd, you might win the media war on day one, but you'd lose the policy battle because the medical profession would just be so defensive. And so that's why we went with a publication in the MJA at the same time as we released support. And that, that I learned that from when I worked in Queensland and we'd done a, a particular approach to quality improvement. And, you know, I'd spruit this for years and one of the 
CEO said to me, oh, I finally understood what it was about. I read your article in the MJ because we wrote an article in the MJ about it. And I thought, oh, you know, this is a mechanism that gets to a particular audience. And so we wanted to use that mechanism to get to that audience to try and influence that behaviour. Um, so, yeah. Uh, yeah, anyway, I, so it, it, it's, I, I can't give you a scientific answer, but it's partly about, you know, not, as, as Mark said, the, you know, just going in the media might, may not actually, may be a sign that other strategies have not worked, but mm -hmm. um, it, it is about being really careful about what the benefits and weaknesses are of each strategy. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Did you, I'm going to go to Emily next, um, but did you, do you tend to give, particularly the de Department of Health, if it's something relevant to them, do you give them early sight of things? Yeah, or? yeah, yeah. yeah. They, they see it, but they see it before it goes out, always, yeah. and sometimes well before that as well. Yeah, great. Okay, over, over to you, Emily. Thanks. I've actually got two more questions at all. Uh, one's very quick. Um, but the, what I was going to ask is, you know, you're obviously very, very, you know, very senior, as senior as possible in the health department. And people often view that as a position of great influence. And then you've also moved into this place where you're influencing ex externally. I just wonder if you could compare and contrast the different types of influence that you had being inside versus outside. Um, and yeah, I mean, because people are often facing that choice. Do you stay within the system and work on it inside or do you have uh, uh, stay outside the system and work the other way? Um, it's not a dichotomy, Emily. Um, so I'm on the Strengthening Medicare Task Force, which is, is that inside or is that outside? I'm not entirely sure. Um, and so you, you have, there are lots of roles that are sort of straddling both. Um, and obviously, if you've got your hands on the levers, you can do more than if you are trying to influence other people to use those levers. Um, on the other hand, you're less constrained in what you say if you're outside and less, in a sense, compromised. Um, one of the things you learn, I learned, is when I was secretary, there's always someone above you to whom you're accountable. In every role, there's always someone above you to whom you're accountable. So you're never totally autonomous, um, except if you're an academic. Um, so um, uh, you, you know, you, you, you know. I, I remember I was thinking about this yesterday. Actually, I remember I had a meeting with um, Carmen Lawrence, who was the health minister at the time, and she wanted to talk about men's health and she said to me I can see you rolling your eyes you know this is a serious issue and blah 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 so you know I had to she was above you know I had to respond to you know she's interested in men's health we had to think about how we might actually develop policy and do things on men's health even though I thought it was at the time I'm not sure whether I still think but I thought it was trivial in terms of policy priorities but um you know, so you have to do things, every job has things you think, do you really have to do that? So anyway, so both, I think, have their joys um, and um, both have their limitations. And my last quick one, um, your table of, in, of, of sort of intermediate factors in terms of influence, like numbers of contacts with policy makers mm -hmm. or stakeholders, is that something you could share with us or is that an in-house conversation? I'd prefer not because I'm no longer at Grattan. <laughs> oh, uh, but I don't mean the, the actual things. That you, well, would you uh, yeah, be able to give us information about who we Well, could I could tell you what they were. Um, you can write them down, but they were obvious things when you think about it. We had to write, you know, the number of reports. And incidentally, Grattan has moved away from this approach a bit, but um, there are things we had to think about. You know, how many op-eds had I written? How many speeches had I given? How many Grattan events? How many people were in those Grattan events? How many stakeholder meetings? How many political stakeholder meetings? Um, and they were analysed by what party, what state. Um, yeah, so it's meetings and media. How many media mentions? Um, yeah, those sorts of things. 
they are all intermediate measures. Yeah. Thank you. Thanks, Stephen. Thanks, Emily. Over to Gabrielle. I can't believe nobody else is asking questions. What an opportunity this is. Um, I'm going to ask a different version of Emily's first question, Emily Banks's first question, which is, how would what would you advise our smart postdocs who want to be influential to do? How would you advise that they organise their careers so that they can, over the course of their careers, be as influential as possible? So, Gabrielle, I'm exactly the wrong person to ask that question of. I never planned my career. I fell into jobs, and most of the jobs I got, I was invited to apply by someone on the interviewing panel or whatever. So I'm a very bad example to give career advice to anybody. However, um, the, other, the other point I'd make is that my research was always very applied that I've made no great theoretical contribution in the course of my career but I have made an enormous applied contribution um, and that applied contribution had a sound academic underpinning and most of my publications are in applied type journals it's not entirely true but close to true so I suppose you've got to make a decision about whether your career is going to be one which is at the applied end of the academic spectrum or not and you then do work which is applied. I mean, my, my PhD was on hospital accreditation. And it started, I started on a different topic, and then I junked it because I was approached to evaluate the hospital accreditation program in New South Wales. And I got a consultancy grant to do it. And hospital accreditation was only allowed to start in New South Wales, on condition that be evaluated and evaluated by me. So my very first exposure was a very, very applied sort of approach. And so nowadays, I think PhDs are poorly, the pre PhD programs mostly are poorly designed because I think there should be work exposure as part of PhD programs, that you should be doing a PhD, in, in a, especially in a place like NSEP, but doing PhDs which are relevant to the problems that public health system is facing and be heavily engaged as much as possible in, in working with people who want to consume your research. Um, one of the ANU PhDs was by a guy called Brendan Gibson. I cited it recently where he talked about the need that, the, that it was not about translating research into practice. It was about transforming knowledge from academic life to make it fit a different paradigm in, in bureaucratic or policy world. So you start off with getting a process which engages you right from the start and also in your postdoc and so on, and then um, moving in and out. So my career, I, I was I worked in a hospital, but now I worked in academic life. Then I knew I wasn't gonna get promoted internally because the University of New South Wales didn't promote people internally to professor. So I went and worked in a in the health department of Victoria. And I was able to do that because of all my applied work. And then I was able to go back into academic life because I'd published while I was a bureaucrat. And so I was this boundary spanner all my life. And um, I found that really fun. And um, it gave me options. So that's all I can say. As I said, I'm not a good role model. Thanks, Gabrielle. Thank you, Stephen. I, I echo what Gabrielle said. What an amazing opportunity to have a discussion with you. So thanks so much for taking the time to talk to us. I think the presentation, but also the discussion that followed. I know we could keep going for much longer because I still have questions, but um, I'll, I'll hold them off. But um, I want to, before we wrap up, I do want to thank uh, Mitran and 
uh, Son Yuen and Jin Hu Lee, who are organising this series and doing a wonderful job, and Toby, of course, who always does a fantastic job in putting these together. But our biggest thanks, of course, go to you, Stephen. Um, so join with me. If there's any final words of wisdom for us before we all get on to uh, less enjoyable things but important stuff. <laughs> nope. <laughs> no. Thank you, Stephen. Thank you all for joining us. We'll see you at the next at the next policy seminar. And safe travels, Stephen. Okay. Thanks very much. See you, see you later. everyone.